Welcome, everyone, to episode 383 of Just Joshing. Story time returns. I read from chapter 4, part 3, or level 1, 4, chapter 3, depending on your point of view. And my reading guest today is the one and only Susie Vidori. I'm going to talk about Susie a little bit more after the ad, after we go through my reading. So we're going to go through my reading first, and then I'll be back, and we'll talk about Susie. But until then, let's get started. Johnny's finally going to come face to face with Lisa, and I've been building this up since the very beginning. So hopefully you guys will enjoy where it goes from here. This episode of Just Joshing is sponsored by Indie Imprint. Indie Imprint supports creators by creators. Whether you are writing a book or creating a video game, Indie Imprint works with its clients to produce, edit, and present their projects to the world. For more information, check out their website at www.indieimprint.com. The Cloud Diver, Level 1-4, Chapter 3. The elevator couldn't move fast enough. My heart was racing as the doors opened and I bolted in, fumbling at the buttons until I pressed 8. I was scared. What exactly would I see when I get there? If she was okay, did she hate me? The door opened and I raced down to a chorus of screens. It was mean old Mrs. Forney. Eyes closed, her face was crimson and emerald with visible veins. It hurts! It hurts! Mrs. Forney had been a force in this town for as long as I could remember. She had been old when I was young and had a natural hatred of everyone in town and shared it with everyone who gave her a chance to talk. Now that I saw her like this, I realized just how much I missed her scowling. Two nurses were arguing about how another shot at Corazon, pointing fingers like another at guns. I didn't pay attention to what the nurses were saying too much. Instead, I gazed down at the great evil nemesis of children everywhere. She looked so fragile, as if she was about to break. Dozens of other people were in the hall, suffering to various degrees. Some only had quiet moans escaping their lips. Others weren't screaming at all. And that worried me more. Survivor's guilt smacked me in the face. I didn't deserve to be in this spot. I'd been fortunate because of oil lights policies and medical packaging that was properly protected from diseases. These people suffered the full brunt of the peg, and my guilt amplified with each passing by a familiar face, telling myself that with little rationality I thought that I would probably be lying here if I had stayed didn't make it any easier. Door 85 came up far too soon. My nerves frayed with the guilt. I wasn't ready for this. I had no idea what to expect when I opened the door, and that freaked me out. Would she be one of the screamers that I had passed, or was she worse? Part of me wanted to turn back at the thought, okay. I said to myself, you can do this. You need to do this. I opened the door. She looked a lot like the person I remembered. She was older, face a touch more mature and hardened than I last saw her, but it was her. An IV drip fed into her arm and there were blotches in her arms and head, but she was the same otherwise. She smiled at me for just for a second, my heart stopped. It was still the most breathtaking smile I'd ever seen, and it took me back to the first time I kissed her. I know there was something more to this girl because of how she looked into my eyes. I wondered at that moment why I'd ever left. Hi, she asked. Hi, was all I could manage back. There was nothing else that seemed right to add. Truth is, I was trying my best to come up with something clever or way to say, and I couldn't. Nothing was enough. My problems didn't seem like a big deal when she's lying there sick or dying. I mean, asking, how are you, seemed very empty at that moment. You like my hair? Huh? I answered, crashing down to earth. I had doctors adjust my hair, you know, just keep the latest styles. Her hair was too nice to be a mess. She'd been lying in a bed for far too long, and it was more static than straight lines. I shook my head and smiled. You need a better stylist, I grinned, and you need better material. She motioned me over. I walked to her and felt her arms wrap around me. She just held me, and after a few seconds, I put my hands on her and hugged her back. My breathing slowed. All my fears, doubts, and anxieties were gone. All was quiet, and for just one second, again, the world was only her. And then she let go. How have you been, I asked, wincing her as I just broke my own rule. Life was good. Met someone. Got a job working as a programmer up here. Really? I was proud of myself. I didn't squeak when she mentioned she met somebody else. Of course she met someone else. She was smart, sexy, and beautiful. Anyone would be lucky to be with her. I realized I had been a fool. I had made the wrong decision in my life. I wanted to cry. I laughed and said, sit down, dumbfounded and groping for something to say. So, she said after she saw me fail at listening to the conversation. How have you been? Good. Well... I dropped my head. I'm in trouble. 
I could never lie to her. I, I had to be as real to her as possible. One thing my mom and dad told me was that love should never be based on a lie. I lied about a lot of other things, but that piece of advice I took to heart. For her part, she stopped and waited for me to tell my tale. She listened to my story about the library and what I found inside it, how I met Glenblade, Stevie Wise Force Escaped, and more. She occasionally asked a question to clarify or pointed to, but otherwise just let me continue on through until I caught up to now. Once I had, silence surrounded us for a while. For boring feeling came to me during the silence and my heart ate. This meeting wouldn't last long. I didn't want to listen to that voice in my head. Instead, I was doing my best to keep that feeling Billy while she pondered my tail. So what are you going to do, she's asked. I shook. I, I have no idea. Is that such a bad thing? What do you mean? All your life you've been doing what's expected of you. We all want the dream, uh, the dream, the good job, security, family. The smile was a little better on the last part and I blanched. No matter how I slice it, I left Lisa for the right thing. I'm sorry, I said. Don't be, Lisa assured me. Things worked out. I met someone and it's gone well. My heart sank. I mean, intellectually speaking, the idea of her waiting for me was a fairy tale at best. Still, I couldn't deny the crushing blow to my ego. That great love was over. All I had was, well, nothing. Glad to hear it, I've managed to say evenly and with some honesty. I mean, it's not me, but does that matter? I like to think that this was a rare moment of maturity for me. That knowing smirk and twinkle in her eye told me my feelings were transparent. Let's get back to you, Lisa said. You've done what you were supposed to do. Now you're free to do what you want to do. But what do I want to do? Can't answer that for you, John, she held my hand. Only you can. Ugh, cliche stuff. I hated the cliche stuff. Only you can find the answer in some such stuff. Who buys that? Sometimes these obvious things everyone knows resonates and sinks in. This was one such thing. I had to figure it out. I didn't want to. I wanted someone to tell me, to lead me. It wasn't gonna happen. Do I have to figure this out now, I said. I'll write this instantly, Lisa admitted. What do you want to do instead? What have you been doing? The answer brought the smile I love to see. So I spent the next hour or so listening to her story. For a while, I forgot my troubles and enjoyed her telling me everything. This episode of Just Joshing is sponsored by Wall of Wishes. That's right, Susie Fedori is launching the final book of her Aurora nominated trilogy three months early. Wall of Wishes is now out June 30th and pre-orders for Owl's Nest Books start June 21st. Starting June 21st, we will celebrate this launch with both our events, contests, and more throughout the web. Check out Owl's Nest Books for more details, and check out Susie Vidori to find out just what's coming up. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Susie Vidori is sponsoring the podcast for the next month. She's launching her book, Wall of Wishes, starting June 21st. You can do pre-orders. There's a link to pre-order the book in the episode description. I suggest you click on it, put an order in. Owl's Nest Books will ship your book anywhere in North America. I'm really happy Susie chose to actually do this. Um, she, I think personally that Susie's going to enjoy the um, hybrid model of doing business as an author. Uh, it suits her, I think, in ways that I don't think she's fully tapped into yet, and I think it's going to be a blast. And speaking of Susie, one second here. <coughs> speaking of Susie. Susie and I are doing a special little show. This Thursday on the 25th, you are all cordially invited. We are doing a quiz show about young adult fiction. The contestants will be contestants, and I promise you there will be prizes for people that come to the door. Anyone invited gets a chance to play. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about our book a little bit, but we're also going to be just, just – if you're a fan of young adult fiction, if you're a fan of Susie Vidori, if you're a fan of me, come on out. It'll be a good time. I promise also, though, Susie is my reading guest this week, and I'm going to say a real nice thing here. When I read this, I understood reading this why Susie draws people in. Um, she's one of the most energetic, enthusiastic, passionate people I know, and it comes across in her reading. So I'm going to just go into the reading from this point on, but hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy it as much as I did. I'm Susie Vidori, and I am just thrilled to be launching early Wall of Wishes pandemic style. So I've been, like most of you guys, for the past couple of months, cooped up in my house. 
Um, but I thought I would at least come out into the woods and do a reading for you to tell you a little bit about this new book and what it's about. So for those fans of the Fountain series, you'll remember that the Fountain is about 16 year old Ava who moves from San Francisco to New England to find out more about her mom who died when she was 10. And when she gets there, her reputation's preceded her and the kids aren't very nice. And all kinds of crazy things happen to poor Ava and she gets really upset. And she runs out into the woods just like these and she, she finds a mysterious fountain and she makes a wish that one of the girls that she just met had never existed. When she returns to the boarding school, the girl is gone and absolutely everything in her life is different. Even her own family has changed. And she has to find out about the magic of the school that she goes to and the history of her own family. She meets a boy, it's a romance and a mystery, it's lots of fun. So for those of you who remember, and then book two in the series is The West Woods. And this is actually Courtney's story. So it's the story of the girl who got wished away. And it's her story from being a regular girl and all the crazy things that happened to her at the school and the magic that she discovered where she got to the place where she felt like she had to act the way that she did in the fountain where quite frankly, she deserved to get wished away. And so after these two books, a lot of readers were like, well, what happened? What happened next? Cause I kind of left you in the lurch. So we're finally gonna finish this series and I'm gonna talk about the wall of wishes. So Wall of Wishes actually brings together the two characters. It brings together Ava and Courtney, and they have to work together because the Westwoods is going to be destroyed. So they find out that the Westwoods is going to be destroyed, and inside the Westwoods is the fountain. And if the Westwoods and the fountain are destroyed, then absolutely every wish that's ever been made on that fountain will be destroyed as well. And the problem with that is that Ava knows that her father made a wish and her father wished for her mother's love. And if that had never happened, Ava is very, very afraid that she will never have existed and she will disappear. And so this book was a lot of fun to write. I actually wrote it from both girls' perspectives. And so I'm going to read to you um, because they really have to hash out their, their differences in this book. Um, and it was tons of fun to make them do that. So I'm gonna read to you uh, a little bit from Ava's perspective and a little bit from Courtney's perspective so you can see what it is that they're after and um, the problems that they're gonna encounter. Chapter three, Ava. Eep! Margaret squealed again as she threw herself onto the gym floor at my feet, covering her head with her arms. Folding chairs all around us toppled to the ground with a deafening clatter, including the one I'd been sitting on moments before. Matilda, control that bird, headmistress Valentine said through clenched teeth. She shielded her eyes, following the owl's swooping circles around the metal beams that crisscrossed the ceiling of the gym. I'd grabbed onto Ethan's arm in the commotion. My heart raced. I'd seen that owl before in the treetops of the West Woods. Shoo! said the headmistress as she waved her hands at the owl, which paid her no mind. He's not gonna hurt anyone, said Miss Crick, lifting an arm to stop Valentine's wild hand motions. It's okay, Izzy, you can come down. The owl dipped one wing at an angle, then came to rest on the stage behind Miss Crick. This meeting is adjourned, headmistress Valentine said to us. You may go. I stood frozen, and none of the others moved either. Did she just call the owl Izzy? Ethan asked me in a low voice. No, 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 Crick said. He's come to lend his voice. The woods are his home. A titter came from the entrance to the gym where a handful of students had gathered drawn by the commotion. Come in, come in, Miss Crick called to the doorway. She waved her arms for the newcomers to join us. None did, but Miss Crick still beamed. I'm glad you're here too, Moira, as I unveil my plan to save the West Woods, she said to headdress, headmistress Valentine. Ms. Crick shrugged off her ill-fitting blazer, hanging it with neat corners over a nearby chair. My mouth hung agape as she began to unbutton her blouse with her knurled hands. What is she doing? I whispered to Ethan. She's having a complete meltdown, Ethan said out of the side of his mouth. This is hard to watch. We should stop her, Margaret said, tugging on the hem of my hoodie. Her horror crept along the bones of my arms, mingling with my own. Ms. Crick was a runaway train and I wasn't about to step in front of it and get crushed. Matilda, stop this right now, Headmistress Valentine rushed to grab Miss Crick's blazer, throwing it over her. And when Miss Crick batted it down, 
Valentine grabbed at Crick's blouse, holding it together at the top. But Crick already had three buttons undone and pulled her blouse over her head, discarding it with a flourish. It sailed through the air, landing on a heap on the stage, where the owl perched, his spindly talons gripped along the edge. I let out a long breath, feeling a gurgle of relief in my throat to see that Ms. Crick wore something more substantial than undergarments under her blouse. Stop this strip tease right now, said Valentine, using her best principal voice. But Ms. Crick wasn't done. She undid her skirt with a swish of her hand, letting it drop to the floor. The cat calls from the doorway fell quiet. The gym was as silent as death. I could almost hear the owl's eyelids blink over his beady yellow eyes. Ms. Crick held her thin arms out to her meager audience as if she were atop an Olympic podium. My relief turned into a giggle. I covered my mouth and faked a cough. <coughs> Ms. Crick stood before us dressed in an ice blue skating costume, complete with a very short skirt that barely covered her crotch and sequins sewn in waves across the bodice. Her bare knees sagged with scandalously baggy skin. The shine from her bodice cast an effervescent hue across her face. Matilda, you get dressed right now, had Mistress Valentine ordered, scampering to pick up Ms. Crick's discarded clothes. The back of the gymnasium rocked with laughter. The four of us clumped together at the front, exchanged bewildered glances. None of this fazed Miss Crick. She pulled at her bun, shaking her head until her gray hair was loose and a high ponytail hanging crookedly off the side of her head. I covered my eyes with my hand. My senses were overloaded. She looks like she escaped from a music box, Ethan said under his breath, a geriatric one. I peeked between my fingers. Miss Crick was still there in all her ridiculousness. Margaret snapped a hand over her mouth. Way to go, Ms. Crick! A boy in senior year yelled from the door. Scattered applause and laughter had erupted in full force behind us. We are going to have a winter carnival to raise awareness and save the woods, Ms. Crick announced, twirling at a pace that threatened to crack her slight frame in two. Her skirt floated about her frail hips like a flower, her cheeks pinked with excitement. Had Mistress Valentine stood with her arms full of Miss Crick's crumpled clothes, Izzy the Owl swiveled his head so that his amber glowing eyes were fixed on Miss Crick, who commanded the stage. Now, who will help me sell tickets to the carnival? Miss Crick asked. Miss Crick's disrobing was all anyone could talk about at supper in the cafeteria that night. I can't believe you were there, my roommate Jules gushed. She blew her fringe of black bangs out of her eyes and flipped her hair <clears throat> behind her shoulder. Did she really take off her suit in front of you? I'm so mortified for her. It wasn't really all that exciting, I mumbled. Why was I defending Ms. Crick? I pushed my food around on my plate. There was no way I could eat. Even Ethan didn't have a quip to diffuse the gloom that had settled over the two of us. Miss Crick was more interested in playing dress-up than actually saving the woods. That much was clear. The idea of a winter carnival was laughable. It couldn't raise the kind of money it would take to reverse the plans for the road that were already in motion. Still, the four of us at the meeting had been wrangled into joining the organizing committee before we left the gym. Or at least Crick appointed us over Valentine's objectives. Objections. The carnival was going to be held at a park a few blocks from downtown Evergreen. Ms. Crick said there was a skating pond, hence her ludicrous outfit, and Ethan had announced that he wouldn't wear a skating costume. And then somehow we were in charge of planning it. Are you really going to help Crick plan this carnival? Jules asked. There are so many better causes we could hold a carnival for, like getting a space on campus for the clubs and teams to congregate. She'd been talking about needing more student space on campus since the fall. Given what we learned about the state of the school's finances, that wasn't going to happen go to a carnival? Jules's boyfriend Jake asked, his question dripping with disdain. He ran a hand through his blonde hair. Ava's grand lives on the other side of the woods, Ethan said. We have to do what we can to stop the road. His words shook me out of the funk I'd been in. It was the second time he'd mentioned grand and the second time I hadn't given her a second thought. I cleared my throat. We'll do what we can to stop it. There has to be a better place to build a highway. Grand's house on the other side of the woods gave us some cover to throw ourselves into this cause without drawing too much attention to how zealous we might get. I couldn't imagine the eye rolls Jules would give us if we tried to explain our real interest in the woods. 
Magic was a tough pill to swallow, and I wouldn't believe it myself if it hadn't happened to me. And so that's Ava and her reaction to the carnival that they're about to um, create to try to save the West Woods. Okay. So now we're going to go to Courtney. And if you remember Courtney from the West Woods, in the West Woods she actually meets Cole. Um, and she has a little fling with Cole, but it doesn't really work out because she's so obsessed with the fountain. But when she comes back in, in the Wall of Wishes, she doesn't remember any of this, because if you remember, Ava actually wished her away. So when she comes back to the school, she has no idea what's going on. She does volunteer to help with the carnival, um, because she just, you know, wants to actually just get involved with something at the school. Um, but she doesn't know anything about the fountain, and she doesn't know that she's actually been here before. And so Courtney comes back to the school, and she doesn't remember Cole, who she had a crush on um, the first time around. But she meets him and his dog Husk again in the woods. But it's a year and a half later, and Husk is no longer a puppy. But Courtney doesn't remember, but something about them feels really familiar. So Husk actually drags her. She's running, and he runs away, and she tries to catch him and drags her under the trees where she finds the wall of wishes. And this is what happens. Are you hurt? Cole asks, still poking around outside the barrier of branches, his eyes popping through the brush near my head. I can't figure out how to get in there. Only my pride is hurt, I said. Here, pull Husk out. I'll crawl out the back way. I grabbed Husk's leash and shoved it through the Christmas tree backdrop. Cole relieved me of the leash and I took a moment to sit and compose myself before slumping down on all fours to go back the way I'd come. I leaned back, expecting to find the support of a tree trunk. Instead, something cold and solid pushed at my back. I twisted, frowning at a thick mess of crisscrossed branches. I scrabbled to move one aside, uncovering a low stone wall. I pulled out my phone and turned on the light. Do you need help? Cole asked. I could tie a husk up and come in. The branches are thinner over here. Maybe you could get out. He'd moved around the trees to my right. I'm fine, I said, just need a minute to catch my breath. Okay, his voice wavered. Words etched on the wall I uncovered danced in the shadow of my flashlight beam, each letter's edges worn with time. What is this? I whispered. The wall beckoned to me. I stretched out a bare finger. It was a list of sorts with dates beside each entry. I wish I read the etched letters aloud. The moment my hand touched the cold stone, a jolt of electricity ran through my arm. I jerked my hand away as if the wall was on fire instead of ice cold. What had just happened? I squinted at the wall, then tried again, this time placing both my palms flat against the rock. My spine stiffened as my connection to the wall was made. A hazy sensation overcame me. Courtney? I heard Cole's voice, but I'd been pulled into some kind of trance. He sounded far away. The wall had come alive under my touch, glowing with a golden warmth that rippled through my core. The den around me filled with colored light, like a movie playing on a drive-in screen, and images of people sharpened in front of my eyes. Their voices filled the space under the trees. My jaw dropped to my chest as my own likeness entered the scene I watched, wearing a hardened stare. Is that me? I whispered. It was me but from another timeline, one that came flooding back. My eyes widened as I watched my own likeness walking with Cole. I had met him before. I hadn't been wrong. I held my breath, barely daring to blink. I didn't want to miss anything. This past was my past. I remembered it clearly now. I'd made a wish on a fountain in these very woods just outside this stand of trees. The past I'd somehow forgotten laid out before me. The desperation I'd felt in those moments echoed through my bones. The things I'd done to Ava, how I'd treated Cole. Scenes flashed before me with excruciating detail. The fountain had pushed me to my brink. It had broken me. It had taken every last piece of my decency with it. If you guys remember Courtney from um, the West Woods, this is what she's talking about. I pulled my hands off the wall. 
My breaths came in short rasps. I wanted it to stop. Courtney! Cole called. My world had changed in a moment. My mouth went dry. My past, my present, my wish, all of it smashed onto my shoulders like a pane of glass breaking, splintering shards all over me. Time jumbled up in my mind. I dropped my phone as my hands flew to my temples. There was no light under the trees now. I'd thrown a coin into a fountain, and I'd become the worst possible version of myself. And then I'd come back to the clearing, but the fountain wasn't there. And I'd thrown another coin into the grass and begged for a second chance. This was my second chance. It had been granted. How, I whispered. Who had been and what I'd forgotten scratched itself across my mind like nails down a chalkboard. I'd been given a second chance, but I wasn't so sure I deserved it. The branches closed in around me where I sat under the trees. I'd made a wish. I'd wish to get everything on a list, a list of stupid stuff that would get me into college, and that it had been granted, and I'd become someone else. Someone who would stop at nothing. Someone who could stop at nothing, propelled by the magic of the fountain. Courtney, Cole called, getting impatient. I couldn't answer him. What would I even say? My hands clawed at the branches, tearing them down, snow and all. Their bark bit into the flesh of my mud-caked palms. Chunks of ice shook loose from the trees above, raining down onto my face and stinging my skin. There you are, Cole beamed at me as I emerged from under the trees, and Husk frolicked next to him, chasing his tail. Did you hear all that? I asked him, my heartbeat throbbing in my eardrums. I heard you tell those trees to get lost, he said and laughed and then paused. Are you okay? You're really pale. I was more than pale. I was going into shock. I recognized the symptoms from my first aid training at swimming. My hands shook. I, I gotta go. I needed to get out of the cold. Okay, he said, his voice shaky. So, tomorrow night? Sounds good, I called over my shoulder as I jogged away, my legs trembling. I had to get out of the clearing. Cole didn't remember me. He didn't know about the fountain or the secrets of the school, and I'd almost forgotten too. Almost. No wonder Ava hates me, I said to myself. The brittle twigs grabbed at my hair, pulling it from its roots, but I didn't stop. Cole was going to think I was nuts. He would probably cancel our date. I needed to get out of the woods. A wall of branches blocked my way. I skidded to a stop, panting for breath. If I'd been given a second chance, I was wasting it. I doubled over, placing my muddy hands on my knees. The fountain had controlled me once. I was free of it now. The new road was going to destroy the woods along with the fountain and not a moment too soon. It had caused me nothing but pain. I remember Miss Crick's busybody nature now. She was wrapped up in the magic of the school. Yes, the magic. I'd said it, if only inside my own head. There was more. I remembered that. I shuddered at the clarity my past provided. The carnival was bound to fail, and that was okay, because the fountain had to go. The edge of the woods was quiet, with no sign of coal or husk. An owl's call echoed through the treetops, sending a shiver up my back. Izzy. His eerie hoot shot through my chest. My soaked running shoes skidded on the hardened ice under me as I scrambled to accelerate. It was all too much. My feet caught on the ground and I burst through the branches ahead, letting the snow rain down on me. I was gonna help get the road built. Then I'd always be free. And so, that's Courtney. If you can tell right away, right off the bat, she and Ava want very different things. Ava wants to stop the road and Courtney wants it to go through. And so that's what this book is about. You'll have to read on to find out what happens and how they solve the magic or how they discover um, the magic. And so I'm really, really excited to be doing this launch with Owl's Nest Books. Um, you can find right now we're doing a pre-launch um, pre-order campaign and you can order books, signed copies of The Wall of Wishes, personalized to you and signed by me and they'll be sent to you. Um, and so look in the comments for the link to buy these books now from Owl's Nest Books. 
uh, between June 21st and June 25th. And as of June 30th, the book will be available in ebook and in print copy wherever books are sold. I have launch events happening all this week. So just follow me on Facebook and you'll be able to learn about tons of different aspects of writing. Something wicked this way comes. Prairie Gothic is a new collection of psychological horror stories set on the vast Canadian prairies by up-and-coming talents. And we need your help. By contributing to Prairie Gothic through Kickstarter, you can unlock special swag, exclusive contributor-only events, and even have a song written about you. Visit kickstarter.com slash profile slash prairie soul to find out more and see what's waiting for you in the wide open spaces. And that was my that was Susie Vidori, ladies and gentlemen. Check out Wall of Wishes, launching June thirtieth for as for official launch day, but pre orders are as of June twenty first. And like I said, me and Susie are doing a little quiz show on the twenty fifth. Feel free to drop on by. The link to that is also in the description, so you guys can come in and enjoy it. Um, yeah, like I said, this was a lot of fun. I want to thank Susie. Next week's reading guest is the one and only Cassandra Arnold. Which is, I got a wild week ahead of me on the podcast. I have Christina Z, who is phenomenal. Dave Butler, also phenomenal. Uh, Dave, I would, I discovered him through Witchy Eye, and I loved every second of it. And I got to have this chat with him, and yeah, I, I'm really, really excited about that. And then Cassandra Iroh is coming to read, and that means Cassandra herself will join the podcast. Next week is the last story time for about two weeks. Um, what's going to happen is... I want to get to I want to get to uh, part five and six consecutively. I have a three part interview coming in the month of July. I have Liana Kersner coming in the month of July. Chase, I want to say Dag in the heart. Dag, oh I mean I know I got his name wrong, but that's also a very important conversation. We're talking about apps. We're talking about a cool little web series. We're talking like just a bunch of cool conversations are about to hit in the month of July. Actually, just for the next four weeks, man. I love every conversation we have. Cassandra Arnold, Joe Conton, Leanna Kersner, Chase. Sorry, buddy. I really screw up your name. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, man, I lost my track of thought. Dave Butler, Christine Z, uh, Marcio. I can't wait to have the mar- the mar- conversation with Marcio. And yeah, it, this is just going to be a wild month. So I'm going to, yeah. So next week is going to be story time, Cassandra Arnold. And then chapter four will be done. And then chapter five and six will run consecutively um, as I launch Alice Zero. So with that all said, now that you know everything coming up, thanks very much for listening, guys. That'll do it for this episode just joshing. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so a number of different ways. Subscribe to it. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher. Uh, I am on pretty much any podcast platform you'd like to find. I'm there. iHeartRadio I'm on. I'm on all the, all the stuff. Definitely check me out. Like it. Subscribe it. Share it. Buy my book. The Cloud Diver is available um, right now on Amazon. Feel free to go buy it. I'm on Kindle Unlimited till the end of August. So if you don't want to buy, you just want to read it, go ahead do that. Um... Let's see. What else am I messing here? My YouTube channel is Josh Pintelaresco. I've been updating that again. Uh, also, that's where Susie Bidori and my quiz show will be streaming. So definitely, if you want to subscribe, do that. I have merchandise. Uh, if you want to buy a t-shirt or support the podcast, you can do that there. Regardless, though, guys, stay inspired. Keep doing your thing. And I'll talk to you guys next week. All right? Keep telling your stories. Josh, Josh.